Welcome. I will record uh, the earlier bit uh, second. That will come in here. This is part two of the second recording. We're looking at narrative writing today. Um, we talked about um, the protagonist conflict with self, uh, with another character, with society and with nature. So these are quite useful ways of seeing the exposition or the setup in any book. Um, then what happens is you can see over here we've got this after our exposition, our beginning, our setup with the, the character setting and conflict in our beginning third. In the middle we have rising action up to a climax or turning point. Uh, and then in our final third, uh, this is obviously, if you remember, a dramatic plot. Uh, episodic plot was lots of versions of these. And in some ways, this could be any scene uh, in uh, a book or film or text, uh, as well as an entire book. You then have the denouement or resolution, which is the ending where you have falling action things basically heading towards a resolution and this would then be probably quite a tight plot maybe a dramatic plot structure as well where it all heads towards one climax and then a simple resolution uh, denouement resolution climax or turning point rising and falling action exposition and conflict uh, really good ways of talking about films or about any stories and narratives. And you can see here, we've we had these plot diagrams uh, earlier when I talked about it, and they tend to follow um, this idea of a narrative arc through a story that you can um, uh, play around with. Ten minutes to go, and we're going to lunch. Quick warning there as well. So every scene, every episode, as we've seen in the episodic uh, uh, plot structure which often is follows a chapter structure and if you think of um, Lindy you were reading Bleak House that was released in chapters as numbers in the 1850s so that was also every chapter that was released was also structured in this kind of plotted way uh, and then in t at an entire text film or book level of course you can follow this form of exposition with character setting and conflict rising action to a climax, falling action to a resolution or denouement. Uh, so you can see here, you've got uh, Cinderella. She lives with the stepsisters and the mother. They make her wear rags, do all the hard work. Uh, this could also be Jane Eyre or Luke Skywalker. Because um, that is Luke Skywalker as well, isn't it? Um, and then we get the setup of conflict uh, over the ball because um, there isn't any conflict really before that. Uh, and then you've got rising action uh, up to the point where there's uh, the ball. And really it's uh, according to this uh, plot diagram, because you could restructure it as well. It's the glass slipper then falling to the resolution of marrying happily ever after. Quite interesting to do a plot diagram of the sleeper and the spindle, of course, uh, which deliberately plays on breaking a simple narrative arc or story arc. I am your father. Uh, James L. Jones, the voice of Darth Vader, um, with us for time. We can also look at plot devices. Now, these are what I think about plot devices is they're very good ways of um, thinking about stories and giving students you know, tangible things to look for and, and um, I, you know, play with. They're also very good ideas for um, exercises, for writing, for reading, for drama, for playing in the classroom. Have a look at some of them uh, and then hopefully uh, we can, uh, particularly developing through English 503, play a bit more with things like plot devices. Um, let me cover some of them we've already looked at because uh, if we look down, um, Plot coupons and vouchers. <clears throat> um, this, I think it's Nick Lowe, um, uh, really thinking about film scripting and screenplays uh, where plot coupons were simply um, the plot equivalent of uh, playing uh, a video game in a plot where you, you gather coupons and once you get enough, you solve your issue or problem. And then you sort of like go through through like a, like a, a, a leveled, um, uh, arcade game, really. 
uh, the idea of a plot voucher is something that one-off solves a situation um, for a character. In fantasy, uh, you can see this happening quite a lot where they'll pick up some sort of item, not know what it's for. But later, of course, that plot voucher will solve an issue for them um, very conveniently. This can feel quite contrived as a plot. However, it's very typical as a genre convention. So readers tend to accept it quite happily within a fantasy genre. You've got the dangler. The dangler. I have to say it in Australian. The dangler. Um, the dangling plot line, also used um, or termed as the cliffhanger, um, which uh, really sort of comes from, from uh, and Lindy will be interested to hear this, from Dickens, and from 19th century literature. Now you're thinking, please don't bang on about Charles Dickens in 19th century literature. We know you love that stuff. But when writing was popularized and made available to the masses in, in these penny numbers, which cost a penny, uh, writers like Dickens became superstars and they wrote um, from month to month. He had to produce books by actually producing a chapter. It was quite painful for him quite a lot. But this is when the structure of the serialized book you know, really took place uh, and, and the cliffhanger was developed. So if you look at Dickens, nearly every chapter ends with a cliffhanger. Uh, a dangling plot line could be an unresolved plot line. Uh, and this might then be waiting, of course, rather like, hence you can see my cultural um, sort of um, play over here as well. The dangling plot line could be rather like um, Star Wars, the unresolved plot line that comes back um, to uh, can justify a sequel, a prequel, who knows. Um, we've talked about foreshadowing, the idea that something might happen later. But foreshadowing often um, works as a sort of prefiguring to a, a plot twist, a completely unexpected turn um, in a story, which is uh, much used uh, was again, we can date back to serialization of novels in the 19th century when this idea of foreshadowing and then seeking for a, like a plot twist, uh, which could be used maybe in combination with some sort of cliffhanger as well, when we don't know what's going to happen uh, to keep people uh, reading when sort of, you know, writing became commodified and sort of with monthly releases, mostly during the sort of 1840s and 1850s. Um, so that's quite an important sort of we've already worked with and people have used foreshadowing when we've looked about it and how you can look at unexpected uh, turns in a plot as, as a way of producing um, drama. Um, Deus Ex Machina um, is really a, a way of uh, an external plot resolution it says there is, is resolving a plot without uh, really sort of just coming with okay you know I don't know there was a flood and they all died. Um, the idea is that sort of, you know, it's like force majeure, something just suddenly happens and everybody's wiped out and that's the end of the story. Um, it's a plot contrivance, which is normally used to um, uh, speak ill of uh, literary works. Um, however, Deus Ex Machina, just a simple plot resolution can often be used quite strongly in um, other genres like fantasy or science fiction. The red herring um, is an important part in uh, in fictional genres such as uh, mystery, uh, horror, crime, uh, because it's very important to, uh, in a sense, it's like a sort of uh, a plot twist or a sort of a, a feigned plot twist as well, where uh, we're supposed to uh, look at uh, a suspect perhaps in, in a crime fiction or wondering who's going to be killed next in a horror story or who the monster is um, and it creates uh, plot interest and uh, suspense. Um, we've also touched on some of the other methods which, in, which stem from in media res. I talked about in media res and a flashback plot structure by starting in the middle. This allows us to then uh, go to a backstory of characters through perhaps a series of flashbacks or even flash forwards. Uh, and this can create uh, lots of suspense and it really um, started off with the sort of, um, again, back in the 1830s, 40s, 50s with gothic fiction and uh, has become a massive part of, sort of 20th century, 21st century fiction. Similar to the frame device, the story within a story, uh, which we know also uh, comes uh, 
from uh, travel writing and the development of the novel in the 19th century. So um, these are some ways that you can look at a plot and you can look at a scene or even a single scene and look at how it's ignore, or, uh, organized and you can put in ideas of plot coupons of uh, a dangler, the dangler, um, of a foreshadowing or a plot twist, uh, an external resolution which just comes out of nowhere, uh, the red herring, the possible solution which is not the solution, um, the idea of going in media res, uh, which means you can then plot the story, as in reorganize the story into I'm going back, I'm going forward, or framing the entire, I'm doing features, here's my video on, my video is on, um, the entire scene or episode or chapter or book as a story within another story, allowing a change of perspective and also questioning the mediated form of the story. Um, a lot of these techniques are really used to describe suspense, uh, to create suspense. And suspense is really worry when we've invested in our protagonist, let's be honest, their dilemma, their conflict. Um, the, and suspense is then built through this central conflict or dilemma, a mystery that needs to be solved or through repetition of, of that situation until you, the suspense is heightened. Um, we're not going to go into suspense in, in a great, you can have a look, I included some ideas of uh, suspense and mystery horror uh, genres over there as well. Um, but you can go after that and working on ideas of conflicts and dilemma and how you can create suspense in plots. That's maybe for the next level of the course. Oof. I was also going to have a look at writing strategies today, and I'm just going to, I'm looking at a wonderful picture of Black Beauty from, uh, I think that's from one of the original uh, illustrations. We've done a lot on writing strategies ourselves, um, and I'm just going to point that to the fact that there's a, a chapter in Munden, and, uh, and that you can look through some of the strategies on dictation, expressing opinions, poems, and note metamaking. making, but it's something that we've really dealt as an integral part of the course. Okay, it's lunchtime. I'm going to stop there. We're going to come back and do some plot diagrams after lunch. Um, so um, I'm going to stop the recording there. I'll go back and re-record the beginning um, afterwards, so don't worry. Um, after the break, we'll be doing task two uh, from uh, the English 2 overview, where we're doing some plot diagrams. Really interesting exercise well worth bringing into even early primary classrooms. Uh, and then we'll be playing genre games. So I'm stopping the recording.